please remain standing as we do our scripture reading. It comes from Luke chapter 11, verses 5 through 13. Then Jesus said to them, Suppose you have a friend, and you go to him at midnight and say, Friend, lend me three loaves of bread. A friend of mine on a journey has come to me, and I have no food to offer him. And suppose the one inside answers, Don't bother me. The door is already locked, and my children and I are in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give you the bread because of friendship, yet because of your shameless audacity, he will surely get up and give you as much as you need. So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks the door will be opened. Which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? This is a word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Oh, gracious Father, we come this morning giving you all the praise and all the glory, for you've been so good to us. You are our creator, our father, our savior, and we say thank you. Lord God, this morning we come asking for a word from you that will open up our hearts and minds and will sanctify us closer to you. Lord God, this morning I ask that you bless me to decrease, that you may increase. Let each and every word spoken this day be of you. And it's in Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. I know we've all wondered from time to time, why do we pray? God has it all figured out anyway. He's going to do what he wants. So why do we pray? I know I've been asked that question before, and I've even asked of myself, why am I praying? God has the answers. He's already, he already knows what he's going to do, so why even bother? But prayer is essential for our Christian faith. Prayer is talking and listening to God, our Father, and our Creator, the one who loves us unconditionally. I want you to think about it this way. For those of you who are married, I want you to think back to when you met your significant other and when you first fell in love with them. You wanted to get to know everything about them. For those of you who are dating, you're probably still going through this. Those of us who've been married 37, almost 38 years like me, we're still going through it because we all change, amen? But the thing is, this person was your new best friend. This person was the one that you wanted to get to know all about. This person is the one that you wanted to share everything that you did and everything about you. You wanted them to know you as much as you knew them. You wanted this relationship to be special. You knew that they were someone that you could listen to and someone that would listen to you. Your best friend. God wants to be our best friend, and he should be our best friend. He created us in his own image. He loved us so much that when we were a fallen world, he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So why do we pray? We pray to get to know our Heavenly Father. We pray so that we can build our relationship with him. We pray that we will be on one accord with him. We pray for a new relationship with him that restores our previous relationship to one that's even better. Yes, God answers our prayers. James 4.3 tells us, We ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your own possessions. In other words, we're asking for what we want and not what lines up with the will of God. We may be asking for a brand new car. We may be asking for a new home. 
whatever it is, if it's not lined up with God, if we're not on one accord with God, then we're asking with wrong motives. It's to satisfy ourselves, our own personal needs, not those that will help others, those that will draw us closer to God. 1 John 3, affirms this by saying, and whatever we ask, we receive from him, listen to this part, because we keep his commandments and do what pleases him. We keep his commandments and do what pleases him. When we do that, then our will lines up with his will. John 15, 7 tells us that if we abide in him and his words abide in us, we can ask whatever we wish and it will be done for us. Did you get that? If we abide in him and he abides in us, that means if we're communicating with him, if we're in a relationship with him, if we put his will first, and when we do that, guess what? Our will is going to align with his because we're no, no longer focused on self but we're focused on the kingdom of God. His word tells us, seek ye first the kingdom of God, and then all things will be added unto you. Wow. We must abide in him. Now, that doesn't mean that we're going to get everything that we want. Let me give you an example. My favorite car is a Cadillac CTS Coupe. Now, I don't want just the standard Cadillac CTS, you know, with the four doors. I want the coupe, the sporty one, the one that starts out basic at $65,000. Yes, I've researched it. <laughs> I also know that I wouldn't stop with the basics because I'm a kind of bells and whistles type person, so I want all the extras. So we're talking that car would probably be more than what I pay for my house. So that doesn't, I don't think that aligns with what God wants for me. So I can ask for it, but I'm pretty sure that I'm not going to get that one. And that's okay, because he provides me with transportation. That is until June 22. Last month, have a 2016 Kia Sorento. I was making out the last payment. Y'all know what happens when you make the last payment on a car. Whew, I was making that last payment, and I was driving from Amarillo to Clarendon in the middle of my move here. Had just dropped off a load of stuff at my new house, and I hear chuck, chuck, chuck. I don't know, all kinds of sounds. <laughs> Never any sounds I've ever heard in my life in a car. Then it starts to slow down, and I'm like, uh-oh. I'm no longer going 75 on 287. That's bad in itself. So I pull off to the road, and no sooner had I pulled off that the car died, completely died. It has not started since maybe around the 22nd, 23rd of June. It's sitting over at Kia here in, in Amarillo, and they tell me they can't get it fixed to probably September. That coupe is looking really good. <laughs> but I know that coupe is not in my budget. So we're sitting there, and fortunately, my husband is in his truck behind me, and he pulls over, and we call the tow truck, and they say it's going to be three hours. Now, look, Lord, now, you know, we've had this conversation about patience. That's not me. I'm like, okay, well, I guess I better breathe. Okay, Lord. At least I'm safe. Thank you, Lord. At least my husband and my son is with me. Thank you, Lord. Three hours, really? Get a phone call. It's going to be an hour and 45 minutes. Oh, thank you, Lord. <laughs> That's a lot better. They show up in about an hour and 15 minutes, so that was even better, right? Get the car towed over to Clarendon, and the guy says, hmm, 
Well, I can fix it. It'll probably cost you about $10,000. <laughs> okay, Lord. Okay. But you know what? I didn't get stressed out. I said, Lord, your will be done. You know my needs. You know what we can afford to do right now. I'm just going to leave this in your hands. God has been so good because when I pray about that car, which is still sitting over there, I, I, and he has provided me a loaner car. I have made phone calls. Abilene kids said, get it to us and we can have it ready probably in 10 to 12 days. Praise God. That's a lot better than September, amen? It's not a Cadillac CTS coupe, but it's a 2016 Kia that's paid for. Amen? So God is good. He supplies our needs, church. Even though sometimes we have to struggle, even though sometimes we're like, why is this happening? Have you ever felt that way? I know I have. Have you ever felt like, Lord, life is going good, you're blessing me, and then, wham, the brakes come on, right? And it's like, what do I do now? Pray. That's what we do. We pray. We pray because God listens. And again, when our will lines up with his, he blesses us. He didn't have to bless me with a loaner car, but he did. He didn't have to bless me with the knowledge and, and of who to call. And the guy was so nice on the phone. He's like, I said, well, my car's in Amarillo and my uh, towing only covers maybe 175 miles. And he said, hold on a minute. He came back. He said, my manager said that this is a Kia motor problem and we will reimburse up to a certain amount for towing. Praise God. He said, with this being a motor problem, that means that the repair is covered 100%. Praise God. <laughs> Church, God is faithful. Amen? John, 1 John 5, verses 14 15, through 15 puts it this way. And this, is the confidence that we have toward him that if we ask anything according to his will he hears us and if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask we know that we have the request that we have asked of him he gives us what we need amen May not be a Cadillac coupe, but it's what we need. And, and I love the testimony of Emerson Plummer. What an awesome testimony. You know, here she was at camp, and she said on Wednesday night, I know y'all just heard it, but I'm going to repeat it for those of you in the balcony that may not have heard everything. I can say that, in the balcony. You know, here was a teenager that went to camp, and there was a girl who was having back pain who went down for prayer. And God heard the prayers and he healed her body. Amen? Y'all, we need to expect a miracle. When we pray, we pray because, well, that's what we're supposed to do. Do we expect anything from it? Most of the time when we pray, we're just like, okay. Well, they say I should pray every day, so I'm going to go ahead and say my prayers, but God's already made up his mind. Has he? I want you to think about Exodus chapter 32, when God was so angry at the Israelites because they had made this golden calf, and they were down there celebrating and worshiping, worshiping this calf, and he told Moses, I'm going to destroy those stiff-necked people. Does that sound like some of us, stiff-necked, stubborn, set in our own ways? Ouch. Okay. Well, I guess I'm just talking to me, but okay. But Moses said, God, remember your promise to Abraham that these would be your people. Now, God hadn't forgotten his promise. 
but he was angry at us just as we as parents get so angry at our kids we said I'm just gonna kill them oh wait till that child gets home I'm gonna kill him has anyone else said that <laughs> if I had money for every time I said I was gonna kill one of my boys and I have four of them I think I could afford that CTS But I love them so much that I would never harm them. God's not, God said, I'm not going to harm them. He said, okay, Moses, these are the stiff-necked people that I chose. They're the ones that I love. They're my chosen people. All right, go down there and tell them they need to get their act together. And he allowed them to live. Just like we allow those little knotheads of ours to live. But I want us now to take a, a few minutes and look at verses 5 through 13. I, I jump ahead to this because we all know the Lord's Prayer. And although we recite it every Sunday, it's not because it's some ritual that we recite. It's to remind us how to pray. Jesus didn't say we had to say that specific prayer, but he was teaching the disciples how to pray. Because at the beginning of chapter 11, they asked him, Master, teach us how to pray. Now, these were Jewish men. They had been taught how to pray since the day they could speak. But most of the prayers that they had been taught were prayers that had been passed down from generation to generation. I believe they were asking Jesus how to pray to connect with God, to draw closer to him. And Jesus gave them a couple of parables to show them how much God loves them. The first one is about the friend who comes knocking at the door at midnight. Come on, who's going to come asking for bread at midnight? Y'all go to bed hungry. But in the eastern country, just like in the south, when people come to visit us, what's the first thing we do? You want something to eat? When people come to visit the Methodist church, what do we do? We feed them. So here this man was, his friend had come from a long journey, and the reason he got there so late is because it's hot over there. It's hot in the Middle East. It's hotter there than it is in Texas. Been there for two years. It is hot. And, and, and so they walked everywhere they went, and it was easier to walk at night because it was cooler. So this friend shows up at midnight, and he's visiting his friend who's probably poor. And back in the day, they didn't have preservatives in all their food. So they made just enough food for the day. And the story says that he had no food left. So he went to his neighbor, knocked on the door, and said, can you help me? I have a visitor, he's hungry. And the neighbor knew that this was the custom. So had it been earlier, he probably would have just gave him the bread and went on about his business. But his whole household were asleep. Now, they don't have all the many bedrooms that we have. What they had was one room where all the family slept. And they all squeezed up together to help stay warm. And so when he knocked on the door, he disturbed the whole household, including the animals, because they're brought in to a certain area of the house, the outer portion, where they slept at night. Again, had he come earlier, the door would have been open. There's one door and one window, and they were shut. So here we have this man resting, and the door is knocked on this his friend comes and knocks on the door he doesn't want to get up but the friend kept insisting please help me he's hungry I'm hungry you know we need to feed this man or family and eventually his neighbor relented his neighbor gave him something now this isn't saying that we need to be persistent in prayer that's not what this text is about scripture does tell us that we need to be persistent in our prayer but this text is saying that God will supply your need. Amen? There was a need. There was a hungry traveler. There was no food, but God supplies. 
just as this friend supplied their need. The second part of this parable is this. It says that which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? This reminds me of a story that I read while studying my lesson uh, for this week. It's about a woman who wrote to Dear Abby back in the day. It was like 1980-something. And so she wrote this letter, fed up. She had a 19-year-old son who had gotten in trouble with the law. The judge had put him on probation. He got in trouble again. So they put him in jail. The son would call home and ask for things, cigarettes, Doritos, money for Big Mac. I did not know you could get a Big Mac in jail. All these things. And the mother was like, no, he needs to learn his lesson. We're not giving him anything. She did admit, though, that she would send him money for cigarettes. But she told the father, don't give him anything else. But the father would continue to put money on the books so he could get the Doritos when they had those, so he could get the Big Mac, so he could have some things. And it was causing tension in the home. So the mother asked Abby, am I wrong for what I'm doing? Now, the author of the story never told me, you know, how it was answered. That's for you to decide. But I'll tell you what our Heavenly Father would do. He would supply our needs. Amen? He would look beyond our faults and see our needs. He would understand that although this this child had done wrong and deserved to be in jail, he still deserved to be loved. So you decide who was wrong, the mother or the father. Hmm. God will supply our needs. That's why we pray. We pray so that we can draw closer to him. We pray so that we will know his will, so that we will be on one accord with him. So that when we do ask for something, we know he will answer because our will lines up with his will. Amen? We pray to be in a better relationship with God. Now, most of us have probably heard the acronym ACTS, A-C-T-S. Back in the day, it was how we taught people to pray. It was what we said about the Lord's Prayer. We said that first you talk to God about his, your adoration for him. That's the A, adoration. God, you're wonderful. God, you're worthy. JP mentioned that in his prayer this morning. God, you're good. You're loving, you're kind. Then we have the C, which is confession. We confess our sins before God. Then we have the T. Anybody remember what the T is? Thanksgiving, amen. Somebody's been doing their Bible study. <laughs> amen. Thanksgiving, we give thanks to God for his goodness and all that he's blessed us with. Then we have supplication. We make our requests known to him. This morning, I want to share another acronym with you. It's Christ. Now, I know many of us use the word Christ in the day. Hopefully, it's good when we say Jesus Christ. But Christ is this. C stands for concentrate. Concentrate on the one you're praying to, not on your prayers, it's not about you. It's about God. Amen? It's about getting to know him. It's about speaking to him. And it's about listening to him. How many times do you get up from your prayer after you say what you want and say amen? And you get up, you're done. Oh, but God wants to talk to you. Let's remain there for a moment and listen. Concentrate on God. The H is for hallelujah. Give him praise. You can do that throughout the day. You can, you can pray and, and praise and thanksgiving throughout the day. I do it all day when I'm driving. I think some people may think I'm crazy. Hallelujah! You know, it's okay. 
and I can sing off key all day long in my car by myself. I want you to know I was really worried sitting by George this morning singing. Whew, that took me back to my choir days and I, that my voice got smaller and smaller. And then he had enough nerve to turn his head that way, I shut up. <laughs> but God says to make a joyful noise. He doesn't care if we're off key as long as we're singing hallelujah to him. R stands for ruler. God is the ruler of the kingdom. And when we exalt the ruler, and when we call on his name, praying to him, asking for our needs, our daily needs to be blessed and provided, who can deny us? The ruler's listening. He runs the kingdom. Which brings me to the almighty I. You know, we love I, I need, I want. But there is a time during our prayers when we can say, Lord, I need, I need your help. I need your protection. I need to know that I am loved. And God is faithful to answer our prayers. He's faithful to supply, as Jesus said, our daily bread. Amen? John 15, verses 5 through 7 says, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. If you remain in me and I remain in you. See that connection again? We have to be connected to the vine. He says, apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. Remain in him, church, and let him remain in you then your will will line up with him and you will be blessed. We can do nothing without God, but through him and with him, we can accomplish all things. Just as our little children said this morning, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Which brings me to the S, which stands for Savior. God is our Savior through Jesus Christ. It's our relationship in Christ that unites us with God. We need to recognize that. Then I love T. Triumph. Triumph over our temptations. We have all kinds of temptations. Physical, spiritual, sexual. You know, most of them we can just look at and go, oh, especially... Those of us on a diet, we see that donut and we want it. But we can say, yield not to that temptation. I'm going to go get me a carrot. <laughs> God will help us with our temptations. The most difficult ones are the spiritual ones, the ones based in fear. I don't want to get up and speak in front of all these people. I'm afraid. I don't want to sing. I don't have a beautiful voice. I don't want to go over there in that neighborhood and volunteer because those people don't look like me. They don't act like me. They're not Christians. I don't want to. I'm afraid. But you know what? When we don't yield to that temptation, when we trust God, it's like 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13 says, no temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man, but God is faithful. God is faithful. Who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. We pray so that God can yield us from temptation. He can keep us from yielding to it. He can deliver us from it. That's why we pray. Pray, and God will answer your prayers. 
We pray to receive his spirit, the one who gives us power, love, and a sound mind. We pray that we may draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace in our time of need. Pray the prayer of Christ and watch how God blesses you. Amen? Amen. Let us pray. Oh, gracious Father, we thank you for your words this day. Lord God, we ask that you will burn them in our hearts, that we will continue to listen, continue to align our will with your will. Lord God, that we will put you first in all that we do and all that we say. Then, Lord God, we ask that you bless us to go forth sharing the good news of Jesus Christ so that others may be saved, so that others will know you, that they will love you as we love you. And it's in Jesus' holy name we pray.